Chapter Twenty Three. Wenceslas got home at about one in the morning. Hortense had expected him ever since half past nine. From half past nine till ten, she had listened to the passing carriages, telling herself that never before had her husband come in so late from dining with Florent and Chanor. She sat sewing by the child's cot, for she had begun to save a needlewoman's pay for the day by doing the mending herself. From ten till half past, a suspicion crossed her mind. She sat wondering, "Is he really gone to dinner as he told me with Chanor and Florent?" he put on his best cravat and his handsomest pin when he dressed he took as long over his toilet as a woman when she wants to make the best of herself i am crazy he loves me and here he is but instead of stopping the cab she heard went past from eleven till midnight hortense was a victim to terrible alarms the quarter where they lived was now deserted if he has set out on foot some accident may have happened thought she a man may be killed by tumbling over a curbstone or failing to see a gap artists are so heedless or if he should have been stopped by robbers it is the first time he has ever left me alone here for six hours and a half but why should i worry myself he cares for no one but me men ought to be faithful to the wives who love them were it only on account of the perpetual miracles wrought by true love in the sublime regions of the spiritual world the woman who loves is in relation to the man she loves in the position of a somnambulist to whom the magnetizer should give the painful power when she ceases to be the mirror of the world of being conscious as a woman of what she has seen as a somnambulist passion raises the nervous tension of a woman to the ecstatic pitch at which presentiment is as acute as the insight of a clairvoyant a wife knows she is betrayed she will not let herself say so she doubts still she loves so much she gives the lie to the outcry of her own pythian power this paroxysm of love deserves a special form of worship in noble souls admiration of this divine phenomenon will always be a safeguard to protect them from infidelity how should a man not worship a beautiful and intellectual creature whose soul can soar to such manifestations by one in the morning hortense was in a state of such intense anguish that she flew to the door as she recognized her husband's ring at the bell and clasped him in her arms like a mother at last here you are cried she finding her voice again my dearest henceforth where you go i go for i cannot again endure the torture of such waiting i pictured you stumbling over a curbstone with a fractured skull killed by thieves no a second time i know i should go mad have you enjoyed yourself so much and without me bad boy what can i say my darling there was Bichiu who drew fresh caricatures for us, Léon de Lora, as witty as ever, Claude Vignon, to whom I owe the only consolatory article that has come out about the Montcornet statue. There were—were were there no ladies? Hortense eagerly inquired. Worthy Madame Florent? You said the Rocher de Cancale. Were you at the Florents? Yes, at their house. I made a mistake. You did not take a coach to come home? no and you have walked from the rue des tournelles stidman and bichiou came back with me along the boulevards as far as the madeleine talking all the way it is dry then on the boulevards and the place de la concorde and the rue de bourgogne you are not muddy at all said hortense looking at her husband's patent leather boots it had been raining, but between the Rue Vanneau and the Rue Saint-Dominique Wenceslas had not got his boots soiled. "'Here, here are five thousand francs Chanor has been so generous as to lend me,' said Wenceslas, to cut short this lawyer-like examination. He had made a division of the ten thousand franc notes, half for Hortense and half for himself, for he had five thousand francs worth of debts, of which Hortense knew nothing. He owed money to his foreman and his workmen. "'Now your anxieties are relieved,' said he, kissing his wife. "'I am going to work to-morrow morning, so I am going to bed this minute to get up early, by your leave, my pet.' 
the suspicion that had dawned in hortense's mind vanished she was miles away from the truth madame marneffe she had never thought of her her fear for her wenceslas was that he should fall in with street prostitutes the names of bichiou and leon de lera two artists noted for their wild dissipations had alarmed her next morning she saw wenceslas go out at nine o'clock and was quite reassured now he is at work again said she to herself as she proceeded to dress her boy i see he is quite in the vein well well if we cannot have the glory of michelangelo we may have that of benvenuto cellini lulled by her own hopes hortense believed in a happy future and she was chattering to her son of twenty months in the language of onomatopoeia that amuses babies when at about eleven o'clock the cook who had not seen wenceslas go out showed in stidman i beg pardon madame said he is wenceslas gone out already he is at the studio i came to talk over the work with him i will send for him said hortense offering stidman a chair thanking heaven for this piece of luck hortense was glad to detain stidman to ask some questions about the evening before stidman bowed in acknowledgment of her kindness the countess steinbock rang the cook appeared and was desired to go at once and fetch her master from the studio you had an amusing dinner last night said hortense wenceslas did not come in till past one in the morning amusing not exactly replied the artist who had intended to fascinate madame marneffe society is not very amusing unless one is interested in it that little madame marneffe is clever but a great flirt and what did wenceslas think of her asked poor hortense trying to keep calm he said nothing about her to me i will only say one thing said stidman and that is that i think her a very dangerous woman hortense turned as pale as a woman after childbirth so it was at at madame marneffe's that you dined and not not with chanor said she yesterday and wenceslas and he stidman without knowing what mischief he had done saw that he had blundered the countess did not finish her sentence she simply fainted away the artist rang and the maid came in when louise tried to get her mistress into her bedroom a serious nervous attack came on with violent hysterics stidman like any man who by an involuntary indiscretion has overthrown the structure built on a husband's lie to his wife could not conceive that his words should produce such an effect he supposed that the countess was in such delicate health that the slightest contradiction was mischievous the cook presently returned to say unfortunately in loud tones that her master was not in the studio in the midst of her anguish hortense heard and the hysterical fit came on again go and fetch madame's mother said louise to the cook quick run if i knew where to find steinbock i would go and fetch him exclaimed stidman in despair he is with that woman cried the unhappy wife he was not dressed to go to his work stidman hurried off to madame marneffe's struck by the truth of this conclusion due to the second sight of passion at that moment valerie was posed as delilah stidman too sharp to ask for madame marneffe walked straight in past the lodge and ran quickly up to the second floor arguing thus if i ask for madame marneffe she will be out if i inquire point-blank for steinbock i shall be laughed at to my face take the bull by the horns ren appeared in answer to his ring tell monsieur le comte steinbock to come at once his wife is dying Wren, quite a match for Stidman, looked at him with blank surprise. But, sir, I don't know. Did you suppose? I tell you that my friend, Monsieur Steinbock, is here. His wife is very ill. It is quite serious enough for you to disturb your mistress. And Stidman turned on his heel. He is there, sure enough, said he to himself. And in point of fact, after waiting a few minutes in the Rue Vanneau, he saw Wenceslas come out, and beckoned to him to come quickly. After telling him of the tragedy enacted in the Rue Saint-Dominique, 
Stidman scolded Steinbock for not having warned him to keep the secret of yesterday's dinner. "'I am done for,' said Wenceslas, "'but you are forgiven. I had totally forgotten that you were to call this morning, and I blundered in not telling you that we were to have dined with Florent. What can I say? That Valerie has turned my head. But, my dear fellow, for her glory is well lost, misfortune well won. She really is. Good heavens! But I am in a dreadful fix. Advise me. What can I say? How can I excuse myself? I advise you. I don't know, replied Stidman. But your wife loves you, I imagine. Well, then, she will believe anything. Tell her that you were on your way to me when I was on my way to you. That, at any rate, will set this morning's business right. Good-bye. Lisbeth, called down by Wren, ran after Wenceslas and caught him up at the corner of the Rue Ilerin Bertin. She was afraid of his Polish artlessness. Not wishing to be involved in the matter, she said a few words to Wenceslas, who in his joy hugged her then and there she had no doubt pushed out a plank to enable the artist to cross this awkward place in his conjugal affairs at the sight of her mother who had flown to her aid hortense burst into floods of tears this happily changed the character of the hysterical attack treachery dear mamma cried she Wenceslas, after giving me his word of honour that he would not go near madame marneffe dined with her last night and did not come in till a quarter past one in the morning if you only knew the day before we had had a discussion not a quarrel and i had appealed to him so touchingly i told him i was jealous that i should die if he were unfaithful that i was easily suspicious but that he ought to have some consideration for my weaknesses as they came of my love for him that i had my father's blood in my veins as well as yours that at the first moment of such discovery i should be mad and capable of mad deeds of avenging myself of dishonouring us all him his child and myself that i might even kill him first and myself after and so on and yet he went there he is there that woman is bent on breaking all our hearts only yesterday my brother and celestine pledged their all to pay off seventy thousand francs on notes of hand signed for that good-for-nothing creature yes mamma my father would have been arrested and put into prison cannot that dreadful woman be content with having my father and with all your tears why take my wenceslas i will go to see her and stab her madame hulot struck to the heart by the dreadful secrets hortense was unwittingly letting out controlled her grief by one of the heroic efforts which a magnanimous mother can make and drew her daughter's head on to her bosom to cover it with kisses wait for wenceslas my child all will be explained the evil cannot be so great as you picture it i too have been deceived my dear hortense you think me handsome i have lived blameless and yet I have been utterly forsaken for three and twenty years, for a Jenny Cadine, a Josepha, a Madame Marneffe. Did you know that? You, mamma, you! You have endured this for twenty— She broke off, staggered by her own thoughts. Do as I have done, my child, said her mother. Be gentle and kind, and your conscience will be at peace. On his deathbed a man may say, My wife has never cost me a pang, and God, who hears that dying breath, credits it to us. If I had abandoned myself to fury like you, what would have happened? Your father would have been embittered, perhaps he should have left me altogether, and he would not have been withheld by any fear of paining me. Our ruin, utter as it now is, would have been complete ten years sooner and we should have shown the world the spectacle of a husband and wife living quite apart a scandal of the most horrible heart-breaking kind for it is the destruction of the family neither your brother nor you could have married i sacrificed myself and that so bravely that till this last connection of your father's the world has believed me happy my serviceable and indeed courageous falsehood has till now screened hector he is still respected, but this old man's passion is taking him too far, that I see. 
his own folly i fear will break through the veil i have kept between the world and our home however i have held that curtain steady for twenty-three years and have wept behind it motherless i without a friend to trust with no help but in religion i have for twenty-three years secured the family honour hortense listened with a fixed gaze the calm tone of resignation and of such crowning sorrow soothed the smart of her first wound the tears rose again and flowed in torrents in a frenzy of filial affection overcome by her mother's noble heroism she fell on her knees before adeline took up the hem of her dress and kissed it as pious catholics kiss the holy relics of a martyr nay get up hortense said the baroness such homage from my own daughter wipes out many sad memories come to my heart and weep for no sorrows but your own it is the despair of my little girl whose joy was my only joy that broke the solemn seal which nothing ought to have removed from my lips indeed i meant to have taken my woes to the tomb as a shroud the more it was to soothe your anguish that i spoke god will forgive me oh if my life were to be your life what would i not do men the world fate nature god himself i believe make us pay for love with the most cruel grief i must pay for ten years of happiness and twenty-four years of despair of ceaseless sorrow of bitterness but you had ten years dear mamma and i have had but three said the self-absorbed girl nothing is lost yet said adeline only wait till wenceslas comes mother said she he lied he deceived me he said i will not go and he went and that over his child's cradle for pleasure my child men will commit the most cowardly the most infamous actions even crimes it lies in their nature it would seem we wives are set apart for sacrifice i believed my troubles were ended and they are beginning again for i never thought to suffer doubly by suffering with my child courage and silence my hortense swear that you will never discuss your griefs with anybody but me never let them be suspected by any third person oh be as proud as your mother has been hortense started she had heard her husband's step so it would seem said wenceslas as he came in that stidman has been here while i went to see him indeed said hortense with the angry irony of an offended woman who uses words to stab certainly said wenceslas affecting surprise we have just met and yesterday well yesterday i deceived you my darling love and your mother shall judge between us this candor unlocked his wife's heart all really lofty women like the truth better than lies they cannot bear to see their idol smirched they want to be proud of the despotism they bow to there is a strain of this feeling in the devotion of the russians to their czar now listen dear mother wenceslas went on i so truly love my sweet and kind hortense that i concealed from her the extent of our poverty what could i do she was still nursing the boy and such troubles would have done her harm you know what the risk is for a woman her beauty youth and health are imperiled did i do wrong she believes that we owe five thousand francs but i owe five thousand more the day before yesterday we were in the depths no one on earth will lend to us artists our talents are not less untrustworthy than our whims i knocked in vain at every door lisbeth indeed offered us her savings poor soul said hortense poor soul said the baroness but what are lisbeth's two thousand francs everything to her nothing to us then as you know hortense she spoke to us of madame marneffe who as she owes so much to the baron out of a sense of honour will take no interest hortense wanted to send her diamonds to the monde de piete they would have brought in a few thousand francs but we needed ten thousand those ten thousand francs were to be had free of interest for a year i said to myself hortense will be none the wiser i will go and get them 
then the woman asked me to dinner through my father-in-law giving me to understand that lisbeth had spoken of the matter and i should have the money between hortense's despair on one hand and the dinner on the other i could not hesitate that is all what could hortense at four-and-twenty lovely pure and virtuous and all my pride and glory imagine that when i have never left her since we married i could now prefer what a tawny painted ruddled creature said he using the vulgar exaggeration of the studio to convince his wife by the vehemence that women like oh if only your father had ever spoken so cried the baroness hortense threw her arms round her husband's neck yes that is what i should have done said her mother wenceslas my dear fellow your wife was near dying of it she went on very seriously you see how well she loves you and alas she is yours she sighed deeply he may make a martyr of her or a happy woman thought she to herself as every mother thinks when she sees her daughter married it seems to me she said aloud that i am miserable enough to hope to see my children happy be quite easy dear mamma said wenceslas only too glad to see this critical moment end happily in two months i shall have repaid that dreadful woman how could i help it he went on repeating this essentially polish excuse with a pole's grace there are times when a man would borrow of the devil and after all the money belongs to the family when once she had invited me should i have got the money at all if i had responded to her civility with a rude refusal oh mamma what mischief papa is bringing on us cried hortense the baroness laid her finger on her daughter's lips aggrieved by this complaint the first blame she had ever uttered of a father so heroically screened by her mother's magnanimous silence now good-bye my children said madame hulot the storm is over but do not quarrel any more when wenceslas and his wife returned to their room after letting out the baroness hortense said to her husband tell me all about last evening and she watched his face all through the narrative interrupting him by the questions that crowd on a wife's mind in such circumstances the story made hortense reflect she had a glimpse of the infernal dissipation which an artist must find in such vicious company be honest my wenceslas stidman was there claude vignon vernisset who else in short it was good fun i i was thinking of nothing but our ten thousand francs and i was saying to myself my hortense will be freed from anxiety this catechism bored the livonian excessively he seized a gayer moment to say and you my dearest what would you have done if your artist had proved guilty i said she with an air of prompt decision i should have taken up stidman not that i love him of course hortense cried steinbock starting to his feet with a sudden and theatrical emphasis you would not have had the chance i would have killed you hortense threw herself into his arms clasping him closely enough to stifle him and covered him with kisses saying ah you do love me i fear nothing but no more marneffe never go plunging into such horrible bogs i swear to you dear hortense that i will go there no more excepting to redeem my note of hand she pouted at this but only as a loving woman sulks to get something for it wenceslas tired out with such a morning's work went off to his studio to make a clay sketch of the samson and delilah for which he had the drawings in his pocket hortense penitent for her little temper and fancying that her husband was annoyed with her went to the studio just as the sculptor had finished handling the clay with the impetuosity that spurs an artist when the mood is on him on seeing his wife wenceslas hastily threw the wet wrapper over the group and putting both arms round her he said we were not really angry were we my pretty puss hortense had caught sight of the group had seen the linen thrown over it and had said nothing but as she was leaving she took off the rag looked at the model and asked what is that a group for which i had just had an idea and why did you hide it 
I did not mean you to see it till it was finished. The woman is very pretty, said Hortense. And a thousand suspicions cropped up in her mind, as in India tall rank plants spring up in a night-time. <laughs> 